Hello and welcome to World Denver Talks. Today we're joined by Dr. Christine Fair. She's one of the top U.S. scholars on Pakistan's military and politics. She's an assistant professor in the Security Studies program at Georgetown University's Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service. And she recently published Fighting to the End, the Pakistan Army's Way of War with Oxford University Press. Dr. Fair, thanks so much for joining us. We're here at the KUVO Performance Studio filming today in partnership with Rocky Mountain PBS. Now, you recently said in the New York Times that Pakistan must end its dangerous dance with the Taliban. What did you mean by that statement? Well, the problem is that Pakistan right now is being ravaged by the Pakistani Taliban. And the Pakistani Taliban would not exist if Pakistan had not invested in a zoo of different Islamist terrorist organizations over the last six decades. So what Pakistan is experiencing is blowback. It wants to have those good jihadists that kill people in India and Afghanistan while wanting to have a very selective war against those terrorists that are now uh, mobilizing against the state. And you can't do that. You can't have good jihadists and terrorists. I mean, they're, they're recruiting from the same organizations. They're drawing from the same ideology that the state has nurtured. So Pakistan is not going to be at peace with itself or with its neighbors until it decides that all of these militant organizations are in fact bad news. The strongest statements coming from Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif about sort of no longer distinguishing between the good and the bad militants came in the wake of the terrible attack on a school in Peshawar in December. Uh, is Are those statements coming from him, are they hot air? They're risible. I mean, they're, they are on, on a good day, a bad joke. No sooner had he made that statement, they released Lakfi, um, who is the military operations planner of Lashkar Taiba, who was responsible for the 2008 attack in India. Not only that, the organization's leader routinely um, prances about um, Pakistan's major cities. He holds rallies to the orders of thousands. So it, no sooner had he, had he said that, he basically made a fool of himself. Uh, now, in point of fact, even if he wanted to crack down on these militants, and I don't think there's any evidence that he does, he doesn't control that policy, quite frankly. The military controls that policy. So um, this is one of those situations where whenever he makes a statement like that, the military is the one that decides which you know, how they're going to deal with the militants. So it's easy to make him look like a fool, <laughs> right? And also the Pakistan military, as you're going to learn when you go to Pakistan, they're very good at orchestrating the media. So if they really want to make Nawaz Sharif look like a buffoon, he makes these statements, and then boom, they direct all the media to cover, um, say, Hafiz Saeed, who is the leader of Lashkar Taiba, direct the media to cover one of his rallies. That's the easiest way to make Nawaz Sharif look ineffective. But as I said, I, there's no evidence that he actually wants to shut down these militant organizations. And that's because he himself is a center of right politician and his allies are actually Islamists. Um, some of the, the political partners that he has in his political um, coterie are in fact parties that kill Shia. So this idea that he wants to distinguish, he wants to cease distinguishing good from bad terrorists is just silly. So would you go so far as saying that even this so-called national action plan against terrorism, which includes using military courts to try militant suspects, is uh, does your cynicism extend even to, to that plan? Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, this is just basically an eyewash. They think that by trying these individuals, they can make Pakistan feel as if the military is in control. And of course, these are military courts because they want to show that the military is, is actually um, capable of bringing order where the civilians can't. But, but take a look at who they've actually tried. Um, these are individuals that have been involved against military targets, not civilian targets. And I'm going to bet you money that there's going to be a whole bunch of these fellows on that list who are targeted from the Balochistan conflict. These are not going to be the people that we want them to target. These are going to be people that affect their core interests. And, um, and, and all, oh, by the way, <laughs> if you were to look at the way in which Pakistan collects evidence, we don't even know the people that they're hanging are actually guilty, right? I mean, I hate to be, th that's how cynical I am. It's so easy to pick up any random fellow and pin a crime on him. Um, especially if that fellow doesn't have um, a lobby behind him, and, and obviously they're going to pick people who are, who are easily disposable. So we have to be really cynical with just about everything Pakistan does, and unfortunately most of the people in our government um, are not as cynical as they should be. 
So that really brings us to the heart of your book, Fighting to the End, the Pakistan Army's Way of War. Um, just to, to begin the discussion of, of, of the heart of your book, the famous saying about Pakistan is that most countries have an army, but in Pakistan it's an army with a country. Is that rather simplistic generalization? Does it hold true from your research? I mean, it's, absolutely, it's about as true as you can get. So for all of the things that um, most analysts care about, be it Pakistan's key foreign policies, which would ordinarily be um, the purview of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, right, the equivalent of our State Department, key defense policies that, um, for example, budgeting. Um, in addition to this, obviously, I'm talking about security policy, but even domestic policy. So, for example, education policy. The military controls all of this. And you might ask, why does the military want to control education policy? Well, at the core of that, is that in their education policy, they dictate what Pakistanis learn about India. They learn their own history. And their history that they, that they learn, it's, it's, it's a false history. They learn that they've won every single war. Um, they haven't won every war. They haven't won any war, in fact. So the, the, the ability of the Pakistan army to manipulate the way in which Pakistanis understand not only the country, but the region and the world cannot be overstated. And it, what's, what's really puzzling about it is that you expect this from a place like North Korea, right? North Korea lives in a, in a news bubble. I mean, you can't get into North Korea. It's very, very difficult. But what's interesting about Pakistan is that they have a very vibrant press. They um, have access to all international media. And so this is where this notion of conspiracy theories come in. So what Pakistan's um, media elite do is that whenever there is an alternative narrative that counters the state narrative, they, they introduce a conspiracy theory. And the point of the conspiracy theory is not to say that the conspiracy theory offers truth, but rather to say that what is truth isn't actually the truth. It's just to create doubt. And so this is a very effective way in which the, the, the Pakistani, what they call the deep state, is able to manage Pakistani perceptions. It's, it's really an oppressive apparatus that they have going, considering its exposure to international media. And this apparatus, which you described in very concrete terms, is something that's even propagated within schools. Um, you call it in your book an anti-Indian vision with a strong commitment to Islam as their national ideology. How, how does that play out, as you said, in the education system? In what other ways is it um, perhaps determining their, their strategies or even the daily life in Pakistan? So this goes back to the logic of why Pakistan was founded when, when the British decolonized South Asia. So the proponents of Pakistan said that um, Muslims and Hindus are separate nations and that they can't live together. Uh, and the idea was that in a, in a unified India with a Hindu majority, Muslims would be subjugated to the tyranny of the Hindu majority. And so they argued that there had to be a separate Muslim state for South Asia's Muslims. So in some ways, the founding ideology of Pakistan is a lot like the founding ideology of Israel. People don't like to hear that, but in fact, there's a lot of, there's a lot of comparisons. So this is called the two-nation theory. And Pakistan felt deprived of the process of partition. It didn't get the Muslim majority uh, area of Kashmir. And so Pakistan's demands for Kashmir stem directly from this two-nation theory. And so if Pakistan lets go of this concept of the two-nation theory, a couple things happen. One, the two-nation theory sets up India as Hindu by virtue of, of the design. And of course, India can't accept the two-nation theory because it has Muslims, it has Sikhs, it has everyone else living within the fabric of that state. So the two-nation theory, from the Pakistani point of view, sets up India and Pakistan in a civilizational war that has no end. This also means that Pakistan's demand for Kashmir also has no end. So there is an ideological argument to this, but there's also an institutional argument. Because if there were, in fact, some way of having a rapprochement with India, the ability of the Pakistan army to commandeer all resources and to run the state at will would be deprived. So you'll always see when there's a civilian effort to make peace with India, the army is always the spoiler because they have the most to lose, both um, institutionally, but also in terms of the ideology that they promote. 
Uh, there was, looking at the news today, there was an attack in the capital, Islamabad, on a Shia mosque. The media reports are calling it the fourth such attack uh, in 2015. Human rights groups over the past few years have documented several hundred sh targeted Shia deaths uh, throughout the country. Um, when we talk about the Middle East, we're quite aware of the Sunni-Shia divide, particularly in Iraq. What should we know about the Sunni-Shia divide in Pakistan and how it plays into the reports that we get about militant attacks? So the origins are actually quite similar. Um, they go back to the Iranian Revolution and the Iran-Iraq War. And at the same time, in Pakistan, um, Zia al-Haq was the military dictator running Pakistan at the time. And he was driving a Sunnification effort to make Pakistan a Sunni state. And this was all overlapping with the Iranian Revolution. And the things that he did were very oppressive towards the Shia. So the Iranians began mobilizing Shia militias in Pakistan. The Iraqis, because of course immediately Iran went to war with Iraq, Iraq began supporting Shia militias, and of course the Arab states, not wanting to be outdone by this atheist Sunni Ba'athist regime, they began putting, I'm talking about the Saudis, the, the um, Emiratis, they began putting their money also behind these Sunni militants. And remember, this was also during the period of the Afghan Jihad. So having these Sunni militants was actually very advantageous. I mean, we certainly didn't object to this. And remember, we thought at the time that Shia were, were uncivilized Muslims. <laughs> we were completely okay with backing extremist um, Sunni ideologies. Now, over time, there just aren't that many Shia in Pakistan. So over time, the Shia militias were killed. But the radicalization of Sunnis against Shia has remained. So this has been ongoing for decades. Now, it, it, so it ties into the Middle East because, of course, what we're seeing the, in the Shia-Sunni conflict is really a strategic competition between Iran and Saudi Arabia. So very similarly, tying Pakistan to, say, ISIS, the Islamic State, those elements that are going to fight in Syria and Iraq are those very same militant groups that target Shia because they want to go kill Shia or Alawites, which are kind of Shia um, in Syria. And so th what's happening in Pakistan in terms of the Shia sectarian, the, Sh the Shia Sunni sectarian conflict has its origins in this Saudi Iran rivalry, but the historic specificities of it have to do with events that were happening in Pakistan and Afghanistan when the um, Iranian revolution were happening. But they're very much interrelated. Saudi Arabia puts a lot of money into investing in Sunni madrasas um, and in Sunni mosques that support this anti-Shia ideology. And when Iran can, Iran also tries to support um, Iranian, i.e. Shia cultural institutions, not only in Pakistan, their ability to do that is obviously very restricted, but also, for example, in, in neighboring Afghanistan. So this is, these are all very interconnected conflicts really stemming from the competition between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And final question, staying in the Middle East, obviously the, um, the biggest issue, even on the world stage, you could say these days, is the Islamic State, uh, where, you know, it's risen and spread, you know, where most experts wouldn't have predicted it. It's inspiring attacks, even in the West, recruiting quite successfully from the West. In comparison to something like the Islamic State, could we say that uh, the Pakistani Taliban and their violence a terrible scourge within the country, but still a relatively small problem? Well, I mean, it depends on, if you're Pakistani, they're a bigger problem. About 40,000 Pakistanis have died since 9-11. 40,000, that's an enormous number. ISIS hasn't killed anywhere near that number, right? I mean, they might be terribly, terribly savage. I'm not, I'm not degrading their savagery. But if you're a Pakistani, you care more about, um, and especially if you're Shia, if you're an MD, if you're not one of the, the, the Sunni groups that are blessed um, and, and considered to be the most uh, important kind of Sunni in Pakistan, you're a target. It's open season for you if you're a Shia. It's open season if you're an MD. It's even open season if you're a Sufi, which is, by the way, the majority of Pakistan's population. So when I, as a Pakistan analyst, and, and given that Pakistan has nuclear weapons, quite frankly, I, I find the dynamics to be um, far more injurious to our interests in Pakistan than ISIS. Let's be really blunt. We, we could have eliminated ISIS. I don't, I don't mean to be flippant. Their intelligence signature is incredibly straightforward. They drive around in vehicles that they pilfered from the Iraqis, which we gave them, with their flag. Um, from an intelligence targeting point of view, that's called blow them up, right? If we had actually had a sustained 
um, air campaign against them before they got this big, we could have eliminated them. And I'm a Democrat, but you can understand Obama's problems. I mean, he going into congressional reelections, he didn't want to give the impression that he was leading us into a war. But my friends who are drone pilots, from their point of view, we could have just taken these guys out. I mean, they drive around in regular military formation. Why aren't we eliminating them? So the more ISIS looks like a conventional military, the easier it is for us to deal with them. The reason why we haven't dealt with them is political apathy, nothing else. They're, they are not our existential threat. We have far bigger threats than ISIS, in my, in my view. We'll have to end it there. Thanks so much, Dr. Christine Fair, uh, for speaking to World Denver, and we'll all check out your book, Fighting to the End, Thank The you. Pakistan Army's Way of War. Thanks Thank for you. being with us. Thank you.